the program for today is to introduce the torsion. So we have been doing the transverse shear so far. We saw that uh, we, we uh, analyzed the transverse shear for open sections and closed sections. We saw that the transverse shear is changing or the shear flow changes as long as we uh, go around the, the cross section. What is going to happen here now with torsion is basically we will have a torque is that T that you can see in the figure and then because of that torque it will it will appear a shear stress in the wall right so this torque that you have here will induce torsion and because of that the type of stresses that we will have are shear stresses as well so we also have shear stresses in the transfer shear. In torsion, we will also have shear stresses. Uh, there's going to be a, 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 a huge difference because while in transfer shear, these shear stresses, they are not constant, they are changing in the cross section. We saw last week, you can have linear quadratic distribution of the, the shear stresses. In torsion, the good news is that the shear flow, not the shear stress, the shear flow is going to be constant, which makes this problem much easier than transverse shear, right? So the good news about today is everything I will try to say to you is going to be much easier than what we did last week. That is good news. And hopefully we will have time to start talking about aircraft structures and structural idealization, okay? Hopefully we have time, so we will do a break after torsion and then we start talking about a little bit on the idealization, which is very, uh, very used technique for uh, stress analysis in the aircraft, and not only aircraft, lightweight structures in general. <coughs> okay, so. <clears throat> Let's... Uh, Let's consider then that we have a, a, a tube. So this is a hollow cross section, thin walled cross section, a tube in torsion. And we are going to look closely to this strip or this small element of the tube. This element which is zoomed in here. So this element with points A, A prime, B prime, and B. You have the same points here, A, A prime, B prime and B. So I'm just zoom, zooming in this, this small element. And then we are going to see what is going on on the, on the walls of this element. So if you look at this wall here, I'm, I will try to shade this wall. If you look at this wall, this wall corresponds to this wall here, okay? Between point A and point B. And what you, will, what you will have is a shear stress. This is a shear stress. Which needs to be equal at this point, needs to be equal to the shear stress tau B. You know, from symmetry, I think you, you did that last year in solid body mechanics. If you have, for example, if you think on, on plain stress analysis, imagine you have a, a small element. This is your <coughs> x-axis, y-axis. Uh, this is a shear plane. You have here four shear planes. This one is perpendicular to your x-direction. Same for this one. It's also perpendicular to your x-direction, right? And you have these two shear planes here, this and this, they are perpendicular to your y direction, agree? And then you know that in these shear planes you can have, in a very generic plane stress analysis, you can have direct stress which is sigma xx, is this one, right? You can have in this shear plane another direct stress which is sigma yy. 
and you will have the shear stresses and they are like this. All of these shear stresses, they are tall, sorry. <coughs> this shear stress is tall yx. This shear stress is tall xy. And from, you did this in year two, and I think we did this in year one as well, a little bit. From the equilibrium of the moments, summation of moments equal to zero, we concluded that tau x y is equal to tau y x. <coughs> I don't know if you remember this. Uh, why am I saying this here now? Because that's exactly what I want to tell you here. This shear stress you have here is going to be equal to this shear stress from the symmetry, from the uh, <coughs> the symmetry from the summation of moments equal to zero. And uh, this shear stress here, tau A, is going to be equal to a shear stress in this wall that is not represented here. It's going to be the same as this. Okay? So basically, you can, you can consider this small, this small strip of our tube, you can consider like being this, this, this element here where you have these shear stresses in these four shear planes, right? Same thing there. So basically, try to clean this a little bit now. You will have, in this small, small element, you will have, uh, I can also now delete this. you will have then, in this small element, you will have on the walls, on the walls, you will have a shear stress, right? In all of these four walls, you'll have a shear stress. <clears throat> and now, what we are going to do, this is our x-axis, so if you want our x-axis, this one, right? We have the x-axis in this direction, and what I'm going to do now is, if you look at this small element only, I'm going to do something like this, summation of forces in the x-direction equal to zero, which is the equilibrium equation for the forces in the x-direction. Uh, and then I'm going to consider all <coughs> the, the forces I have in the x-direction. So if we start with this, with this shear stress. So this is a shear stress. I'm going to write it tau b like this. This is a stress, it's not a force. So in order to have a force, I need to multiply this stress by the thickness of the wall, which is tb, and by the length, which is l. You agree with me? So this is going to be the area of my shear plane. If I multiply the area with a, a stress, I will add a force at the end, right? But I also have now, I also have in the x direction, the force produced by this shear stress, tau A, which the, the resultant force is going to be opposite to my x-axis, so I need to subtract, not add, because it was going to be opposite. And that force is going to be equal to the stress, which I will say is tau A, <coughs> times, again, the area, which is the thickness of the wall A, times the same length, L, And if you look carefully, this is the only, this is the only uh, force components that we have in the x direction, because this stress in this wall and this stress in this wall, they will deliver a force in the y direction. So I don't include in this equilibrium equation. 
That's all I have. So in order for this to be in equilibrium, <coughs> this needs to be equal to zero, right? Quite simple, quite basic. Now, there's nothing more we can do from this equation, but we can, we can uh, introduce the definition of shear flow, which basically a shear flow is equal to a shear stress times a length or a thickness. You agree with me? So shear flow is a force per unit <coughs> length a shear stress is a force per unit area, right? So when I multiply a shear stress with a length or a thickness, I will get a force per unit length. I will get a shear flow. And I can do this for the shear flow in my wall B. Then I will say it's going to be equal to my shear stress at wall B times the thickness <coughs> of my wall B. And I can do the same for the shear flow at wall A, which is going to be equal to the stress at wall A times the thickness at wall A. <coughs> or if you want, you can say that the shear stress is going to be equal to the shear flow dividing by the thickness, right? And if you replace now this shear stress here and this shear stress here, you will get something like this. You will get shear flow QB times TBL over TB minus the shear flow at wall A over TA times TAL equal to zero. <coughs> Look at this, TB cancel here, TA cancel. L also cancel because I have equal to zero. I can divide everything by L. So at the end, we arrive at this fantastic conclusion, which is the shear flow at wall B is going to be equal to the shear flow at wall A, or conclusion is in torsion, the shear flow is constant, does not change. That's, a, that's the conclusion we can, we can do, right? If we arrive, so we have there wall A and wall B. We start from, say, okay, I will have a shear stress <coughs> at wall B, which is different from a shear stress at wall <coughs> A. And from, we write the equilibrium equation, and then if we just replace the shear flow on that equilibrium <coughs> equation, we arrive at the <coughs> conclusion that the shear flow at wall B needs to be equal to the shear flow at wall A. The conclusion is the shear flow in torsion, careful, <coughs> is in torsion, not in transverse shear, is in torsion. The shear flow is constant around the wall of my cross section. And that makes our life so easy that, for example, before we coming here, for example, Let's imagine that we have a wall like this. Imagine that I have a shear that is flowing in this wall. Right? This is my shear, shear flow, Q, generic shear flow. Imagine this. Uh, imagine now, for example, let's assume this is, uh, well, it doesn't matter. Imagine that I have a point here. Let's call this point O. And imagine that I want now to calculate the moment about, the moment produced by this shear flow about point O. Imagine I want to do this. One thing I know, this shear flow is constant in this wall. So I can maybe do something like this. I can define, like we did in the transverse shear, I can define a local variable S starting 
at this free edge, for example. And let's see what happens if I consider here a very small element, this element here. Let me try to zoom in this. So this small element here, let's say this, the dimension or this length is an infinitesimal length ds, in, right? And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to calculate the moment produced by this infinitesimal element about point O. Okay? Let's say that this distance from here to here is like equal to, a, is a radius, for example, r. Is a distance, okay? I'm going to call it r. <coughs> okay? So how can I calculate the contribution? So the contribution, so I'm going to say d m0, the contribution to the moment about point O, produced by this, by this very small element in green in the figure with length ds and thickness, um, thickness t. So this, the, the, the wall is thickness t, okay? <coughs> How can I calculate the, the moment produced by this? Well, I know I have a shear flow here, Q. If I multiply this shear flow by the length, ds, I get what? So Q ds is equal to what? So when I have a shear flow multiplying a length, what, if you think on the units, you'll get what? Newtons, meters, or what? Newtons per meters or Newtons per meter square or only Newtons? Newtons. That is what? It's a force. So this is going to be a contribution for the force, a contribution of the shear flow to the force. And then what do I need to have now to obtain a moment? I need to multiply this force by R. Very good. If I do this, I get a contribution of... Um, of uh, this small element to, to the moment. <coughs> now look at this. I think I'm going... <laughs> because I want this to look like a triangle and it, it, this doesn't look like a triangle. I'm going to draw it again, okay? Hopefully I can make a triangle here. <laughs> I'm sorry. So let's see. Ah, much better now, right? So how can I calculate the area of this triangle here in black? Look at this. The area, let's do it here. The area of this triangle is equal to what? You tell me. R. DS over 2. Very good. So if I... If I write this, 2A is equal to RDS. You all agree, right? Why am I doing this? Because I have here RDS. Isn't it? And if I now replace RDS with 2A, I will get the contribution to the moment is going to be equal to... So, first of all, let's not call this area A. Let's call the A because it's the area, a kind of a infinitesimal area, okay? So let's call this dA. To dA. Then I will have here what? Two times the shear flow dA. This is going to be the contribution, the contribution of this small element in green with a shear flow Q there to the moment about point O. 
So if I want now to calculate the entire moment produced by this shear flow when it goes from S equal to zero to, so, so sorry, when it comes from this point S until it reaches this point, what do I have to do? I will have to I will have to do the integral, right? So if I do, if I integrate this, I will get what? I will get the total moment, M0, right? But if I integrate here, I need to integrate on the right-hand side as well. You agree with me? And the good news is this integral is very simple because 2 is a constant constant can move outside of the integral. I'm going to continue here. I can move this variable 2 outside of the integral. The other good news is the <coughs> shear flow Q, like I said in caution, is also constant in the wall. So I can also send you outside of the integral, right? And then I will end up with the integral in the area of the A, which is equal to what? is equal to the total area. I'm going to draw it here in red. Is the area from the starting point until the end point is this area here in red. So I'm going to write it here. A in red is A is this area, A. Area that is between point O, where we are evaluating the moments, connecting starting point and adding uh, and connecting also the ending point. So the area inside this one in red is the area that we are going to use here. So the conclusion is the moment produced by this shear flow about point O is going to be a torque in torsion, right? Torque is a moment, right? In torsion, when we are talking in torsion, that moment is going to be equal to a torque. We can write like this if you want. A torque is going to be equal to two times the shear flow we have in the wall, which is constant in that in torsion. Very convenient. Times the area, this area that you have here in red between point O, starting point, and the ending point. The area inside is the area that you need to, to obtain. Do you remember last week in the transverse shear, we calculated the moment, we had to do the integral to get the force, and then we need to get the distance. And it was a mess, right? Torsion is so easy now. You just need to multiply the shear flow by two, and by the area, you get the moment. That is good news, all right? <laughs> So, what else do we need to do now in, um, in, in uh, torsion? So, this is something you need to start memorizing. First one in torsion, shear flow is constant. This, is this, this came from this first equilibrium equation. Second conclusion is we will, have, we will have to calculate the torque, or I can give you an example where I, I tell you. Imagine the torque is some value, Calculate the shear flow. Well, you can use immediately this equation. You can get the shear flow, right? If you know the torque, if it's given, the unknown will be the shear flow. Isn't it? You can get immediately the shear flow from this equation. That is the second thing you can calculate now. But we need to do something more because we will need to obtain the torsion angle. Okay, when I apply, what I mean is, when I apply a torque like this, a torque T, this tube will rotate, and I want to know now how much is going to be this angle, theta, due to torsion. And in order to do that, we will have to calculate the Strain energy. I don't know if you ever did this. You did it yet? Oh. Okay, so you didn't, do, you didn't do it, but basically it's something like this. Imagine, for example, I, I have, let's say, a bar. 
I apply a force F. Uh, imagine this bar is, for example, is, is clamped here. What is going to happen to this bar? Because of this force, this bar will extend a bit. And this, we can say this is the displacement, right? And then we can say the energy, the energy that we, we, we need to, to, to do this deformation to the bar, if you plot something like this, a force displacement diagram, you will have a behavior like this in the elastic domain. And then we can say the energy, the strain energy, is the area below this curve. So the energy is going to be the area is the area of this triangle, one half FD. Okay? Then we get the energy that is necessary to deform the bar so that at the end you will have a displacement of D. Here in torsion we are going to do a similar a similar way, but it's a bit different from this example I just gave you because now in in uh, torsion, we have a torque, which is a moment, and we have a rotation. But the energy is also going to be, so the external energy, if you want, is going to be one half of the torque times the rotation. Similar, like, like this one. For translation, is a force times a displacement. For a rotation, the energy is a torque times a rotation, theta. <coughs> So we are going to do that. Uh, <coughs> so the, the way we are going to do it is I'm going so what you have here in this in this figure on the right hand side is this small element again. This small element, this is just a zoom in of this element of the tube. And uh, what is happening is when we apply this torque, <coughs> when we apply this torque, this small element will basically distort, right? There's going to be a shear. That's why we have a shear stress and a shear flow in torsion. So something like this, with, something like this is going to happen. And that shear, that shear strain, if you want, is uh, the shear strain is the tangent of this gamma is going to be equal to our uh, shear strain. We are going to consider small rotations, small deformations, very small, so that this tangent of gamma is going to be approximately equal to <coughs> gamma if it is very small rotations. And this is going to be our shear strain, right? This is going to be our shear strain, this gamma, all right? This, all because of torsion. But, so this is going to happen to this small element. It is going to distort like this. And what we are going to do now is we are going to look at this point, in particular to this point here. This point, I'm, I can zoom in, this point move it from this position to this position. Okay? Or if you want, we can maybe consider this point. I think that's what I'm doing in the figure. You look at, if you look at this point, when you apply, after applying the torque, this point is going from this position to this position here, isn't it? And then we can calculate this distance, <coughs> which basically, if you have this angle gamma, uh, L tangent of gamma is going to be equal to this, if, if you call this D, is going to be equal to this distance D, <coughs> But because uh, we are doing very small rotations, we can say that tangent of gamma is equal to gamma. So L gamma is going to be equal to the distance. So 
this is going to be our D. To the distance, when we apply the torque, that point will move by <coughs> a distance which is L times gamma. This is the displacement that point will have. Now, in order to calculate the energy, I need this, right? Force times displacement. We have already, we have already the displacement is here. I need to get the force. If I get the force, I multiply the force with that displacement and then I get my energy. What is the force? Well, the force is, I know what this is. What is this? This is my shear flow. If I want the force, I need to multiply the shear flow by what? ds, right? ds is this length. Then I get the force. So my energy is going to be equal to 1 over 2. Um, the force, which is qds, times my displacement, which is L gamma. Isn't it? <coughs> uh, so we can, just one more thing. Don't forget we are, we are zooming in this very small element of our tube. So in fact, this is not going to be my total energy, but, si but the contribution or to the energy of this small infinitesimal element of this strip here, right? So if I want now the total energy, if I want the total energy, I just need to integrate what I have there, which is... So I will have the integral in the local variable s, which, as you know, is the same local vari variable we used it last week in the transverse shear, that local variable that defines the, the, the path of, our cross of the walls in our cross-section. Then I just need to do this integral. But we still have a problem here, which is this shear strain, this gamma, we need to expand this gamma a bit more. Uh, and we can do it because we are considering elasticity. Everything is in the elastic domain. And we know that the shear strain and the shear stress, shear strain is gamma. The shear stress is tau. They are related by this model of rigidity. The Hooke's law, right? This model of rigidity is the Young modulus over 2 times 1 plus Poisson ratio. So it depends on material properties, right? So we know this. So we can replace, and we can do something more because we know that the shear stress is equal to the shear flow over the thickness. We can do this. So. You can guess what I'm going to do next. I'm going to replace my shear strain with this term here. And then what we will have at the end is going to be only shear flow square. Uh, and then the model of rigidity, which depends on material properties like Young models and Poisson ratio. Thickness of the wall. And then we just need to do the integral along the, the, the walls defined by this local variable S. So I can replace, and then we will have our strain energy equal to 1 over 2. I can send this 1 over 2 outside of the integral. Integral of Q square L over GT dS. This is the energy that I need <coughs> to deform my tube by an angle equal to theta. 
giving a shear strain gamma and the shear flow Q. So this is the energy that I need. Yeah. And let me just check if I'm not missing anything. Hmm. Uh, I can write this in, a, in, a, in another form. So I'm going to copy this final equation. Just a moment. I'm going to copy this for the strain energy. And I'm going to paste it here. I can write this in a different form because I know that my torque is equal to 2 times the shear flow times the area that area in red we talked before. So I can say that my shear flow is going to be equal to the torque over 2A. If I replace this in my previous equation for the strain energy, I will get, I will get um, what? I will get um, uh, torque square, right? L over yeah over four GTA right? Is this correct or not? A square. A square. Yeah, that's it. And then I need to do the integral. Yes, it's correct. Um, I can simplify this a bit more because I can say this for outside so you'll have 1 over 8 T square L A square GT okay so in this equation I what what I did was just to express my strain energy now it depends on the torque instead of the shear flow And now, what am I going to do now? <coughs> we are almost doing the break, so I can see from your faces that you are getting a bit frustrated eventually, but don't worry. The idea is to simplify now, because next, in the second half, we are going to talk on structural utilization. Things are going to be much easier, much simpler. <coughs> so I'm quite sure you are going to be very happy. But we need just to finalize the uh, final equation now before we do the break, okay? Just five more minutes, please, of your attention. So, what are we going to do now? We know that, I don't know if you did that in previous year, but you should have done. The work done by the external forces needs to be equal to the strain internal energy. So, the work done by the external forces in torsion is... 1 over 2 times the torque times the distortion angle theta, like I said before. And the internal work, the internal work done by, uh, uh, in, in a torsion problem, like we, we saw before, is 1 over 8 integral T square L A square GT. Okay? So this term is this term is the internal work and this term is the external work. And this makes sense because if you provide this external energy, the material will deform and the energy it will absorb needs to be equal to that external energy. That's why the internal energy needs to be equal to the external energy. At the end, the energy needs to go to somewhere, right? Uh, and then what can you do? You can simplify many things here. You can, for example, say that this T, sorry, this T will cancel with this square. What else can you simplify? You can, this, 1 over 2, you can replace then this 8 by 4. 
and you can send this this is the length of your tube which is constant you can send this outside of the integral and send to the right to the left hand side so that you will, will obtain at left hand side theta over l is going to be equal to uh, 1 over 4 integral of the torque over a square gt And what is the, the importance of this equation? The importance of this equation is basically this term here on the left hand side that can be obtained from this integral, just including the torque that you apply on the tube. And of course, uh, considering the thickness of the walls and the model of rigidity and this area, but what you what you what you will obtain is the gradient of the twist angle, or if you want, is the twist angle per unit length of the two. Right? Imagine you obtain this. For example, one example. Imagine after doing this integral on the left hand on the right hand side, you obtain theta over l equal to, for example, let's say. 0 0.1 imagine this okay imagine you have a tube like this one so the length l here imagine this is one meter long you want to know the twist angle after one meter long of your tube so what you have to replace is okay i have this so my twist angle for L equal to 1 meter is going to be equal to 1 times 0 0.1 is going to be equal to 0 0.1 radians for example okay but imagine you want to know what is the twist angle for a length equal to 0 0.5 meters then you know that twist angle is going to be is going to be equal to 0 0.5 times 0 0.1 is going to be equal to 0 0.05 and so on right so what this equation what this gives you in this equation is the twist angle per unit length of the tube the longer the tube the more is going to be the twist angle make sense you can see from this equation right the longer the tube is Okay, uh, let me just see one thing. What time is it? It's a good timing. Uh, we have some more things here in torsion, like using multiple cells, but I think it's better to leave this for some examples we are going to do. And then I will prefer, let's do a break now. And then in the second half, let's start structural idealization, okay? We need this torsion concept. I think it's, it's, it's a good way of doing it, all right? Let's start the second half now. Okay, so we what we did so far, we did study the transverse shear situation for the real, if you want to say like that, for the real uh, structure or cross-section, we derive the equations to obtain the shear flow in, in all the walls, and we did that for transverse shear, and we did that for torsion today, which is much simpler than the transverse shear. But the problem now is, if we, re if we move now to a real uh, aircraft structure, if you look at the wing, and what is going on inside, inside of the wing, <coughs> you have a lot, a lot of stuff inside of a wing. For example, if you look, if you look at this figure on the right, so you have this cross section, okay? This, this, and this 
they are what we call spars. So if you have a wing like this, 3D wing, okay? You will have running from one point, from the root of the wing until the tip of the wing, you will have spars, which basically are, are beams. These beams, they can have many different <coughs> cross sections. They can be I-shape or C-shape. One thing is sure, they, the thickness of, this, of these beams, of these spars, is going to be as small as possible. So we are looking at um, the thin walled structures. Uh, so what is, you have these spars, but, and then you have what? You have the skin, you have the skin, uh, right? You have the skin, which is basically something like this is the skin, and you have shear flowing in the skin. But if you have only the skin, which is also the same as this, if you have only the skin with the spars, you have a lot of skin here and here, which will, under the action of the lift, for example, <coughs> and because the skin is very thin, the thickness, it will buckle. It will fail if you don't have anything else. So what we have to do, we have to introduce stiffeners. We call this Z stiffeners, or also known as stringers which is something that we put, uh, for example, I'm going to try to put it here in blue. We, we put here a Z-stringer, which basically is another beam, a smaller beam, which goes all the way from the root to the tip. And the objective or the major aim of these stringers or stiffeners is to increase the stiffness of... <coughs> of the skin of the wing to add more stiffness so that it doesn't buckle so much. So you might be saying, uh, I'm quite sure you, will, you are not going to say that because uh, to be a bit silly, but why don't we have a, a solid cross section? Of course, that will introduce a lot of weight in the aircraft. We don't want that. We want the minimum weight as possible. So we cannot have structures like that, solid structures like that, solid cross sections. We need to have all the cross sections with a lot of stiffeners, spars, and ribs. What else, what else do we have on, on the wing? Because this, the span of the wing is much bigger than the cord, what is going to happen is if we don't have, if we don't add ribs, we will have if we don't have these ribs, we will have in this direction a, a shell or a skin that is going to be too long in this direction and then it will also buckle, even if you have the, the stringers there. So these ribs, the ribs, they are uh, kind of rigid, rigid plates if you want, that are, so you have a kind of a, a pitch between these different ribs. and. The, the, this distance here, usually this distance between two ribs, is calculated based on the buckling of a shell panel. Okay? I think we don't have time to talk about that. Or if we have, a, we can talk a little bit, but uh, this is calculated on that basis. All right? So there's a lot of stuff in in. Um, in a wing, a lot of structural analysis. Uh, how do you then, there's a lot of bonding as well. How do you bond these stringers with the, with the skin, right? Uh, you, you, you have a lot of, uh, you have rivets, bonding. Now, the aircraft nowadays, they are made of composite materials. To bond composite materials with met metal is a nightmare. Uh, a, a metal that composite materials uh, connect very well is with titanium. So there's a lot of research being done on the bonding of composites with titanium. But in order to understand all, all of that, for example, if you want to put some rivets here to bond the stringers to the skin, how many rivets do you have to put? 
what is the pitch between rivets, all of that needs to be very carefully calculated. And in order to know that, for example, the pitch of the, uh, of the rivets, I can give you an example. Imagine you have here a Z stringer. <coughs> Okay? And then you have here in, to, in top of this Z stringer, you will have the skin. So you need to have rivets here that will basically bond the skin with the stringer. So how much, how much should, do you think this pitch or this distance between rivets needs to, to be. What is the diameter of each rivet? Right? All of that stuff. In order to design that, you need to know what? You need to know the shear that is flowing. You need to know the shear flow. This Q, the shear flow we calculated in transverse shear and torsion. <coughs> In order to design all of these things for this bonding, you need to know this shear flow. Because the rivets, they are designed on shear, right? You have two plates that they, they will slide between each other. This is a shear, shear uh, force that, uh, or shear stress that is going to be applied there. So you need to know how much is your shear so that you can design, for example, the bonding. Right? Okay, so we have all of this stuff going on in, 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 a, in, in a wing. Uh, and um, I'm going to delete this now. And what is going to happen is... <coughs> now you can imagine... This, this figure, this is just a bit of the, of the structural members that you have inside of the wing. We call this the wing box. I don't know if you heard about this, but what is inside the wing, all these structural uh, stringers and spars, this, all these components inside of a wing, we define that as called <coughs> wing box. Uh, you can imagine if we apply the transverse shear uh, theory that uh, I, I introduced to you two weeks ago, to this very complex cross section, which is a wing box, we will be here for months doing this calculation, right? So we need to find a, we need to find a much better way of doing this, and uh, that that's when the structural idealization comes in, right? And in order to introduce to you the structural idealization. <coughs> So we are going to try to simplify our cross section, our wing box. And in order to simplify, we are going to make some assumptions. That's why we call this idealized structure, this one on the right. Because we are going to make some assumptions, right? So on the left, you have the real structure with a, a, a stiffener or a stringer and a skin. So this bit here is a skin. This is a skin, right? And this is the stringer. So first thing we need to, to consider is we need to simplify the, the stresses that these components are able to carry. But not only the stresses, we need also to simplify the geometry. Because I can have stringers with a Z shape or stringers with a different shape, I shape or L shape or C shape, yes? What's the other side of the stringer attached to? The other side, yeah. this one here in this direction. No, no, the other, the other. One of its one side of it's attached to the skin. What's the other side attached? Nothing. Oh, it's nothing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, you have yeah, basically. If this is the skin, you will have a Z stringer here, and below there's nothing. Yeah. This is just a stiffener to the skin, right? Um, yeah. So I will say, yeah, we, we have to, to, to you know, idealize a circle, we have to simplify the stresses that the, the idealized circle is carrying, but we also need to simplify the geometry. That is very important as well, because in a real structure we can have many different, we can have hundreds of different types of stiffeners, 
uh, and different schemes with different thicknesses all over the place. So we need to find a way to simplify. And the way we found to simplify is to have a scheme. So I'm talking now about on the Delizet structure. To have a skin with zero thickness, this is an idealization, right? Of course, the real skin does not have a zero thickness. But in the idealized structure, we are going to say we have a zero thickness skin, and we have this cylinder that you see here with a circular cross section, a very known cross section, familiar, it's a circle. Then this cylinder, we call this a boom. It's very known in the lightweight structures, and especially in aircraft. So we have idealized structure which is composed with a zero thickness skin and boom, a boom. A boom basically is a, a rod with a circular cross section, that's it. And then what we need now to know is, we know that the, our skin in the idealized structure, the thickness is zero, but we need to know the area of our boom. And we need to calculate this. So this is the main thing in structural idealization is how much should be the area of my boom so that these two structures are equivalent. Right? That's the point. We don't want to put any area there. We need to calculate that area uh, so that um, um, the two structures are equivalent. And the other advantage of this idealized structure is that in this zero thickness skin, our shear flow is going to be constant, even with transverse shear. You remember before, two weeks ago, transverse shear, our shear flow is linear, quadratic, is a mess, right? All those integrals. In the idealized structure, our shear flow in one skin is constant, but if you cross the boom, we are going to see what that is, crossing the booms. But when we cross the boom, the shear flow in the <coughs> other skin is going to be different, but still constant. That is another great advantage. We have everything constant here in the idealized structure. So the task that we have to do now is we need to find, calculate the area of this boom so that these two structures are equivalent. And I would like to focus now, I would like to focus on that procedure of calculating the area of the boom, all right? And in order to do that, let's do this. Let's consider a real plate. So I'm going to consider a plate like this. This, so let's say this has this thickness, this, this is the real structure, right? So we have a plate with some thickness here. So this plate is fine. What else can we say? Let's say that this dimension from here to here of the plate, this is given by B, very generic B. I don't want to put numbers here. And let's say the, the thickness of the plate is given by T, is the thickness of our real plate. And we are going to assume that, well, we are going to assume the plate has a constant thickness. And we are going to say that the loading that we will have in this plate, because in a wing we will have bending, we will have a direct stress from bending, which will have a distribution like this one. You are familiar with this when we talk about deflection of beams, right? Distributed loads. So let's say this direct stress here, let's call it sigma 1, and this direct stress sigma 2. Is it okay? So this is the original structure or the real structure. The loading is this one. 
And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to draw here on the right hand side, I'm going to draw the, the idealizer structure. So basically is the plate with zero thickness. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to include a boom here. And I'm going to include another boom here. I'm going to say this boom, the area of this boom is going to be B1. And the area of this boom is going to be B2. And as you can see from this figure, I think I forgot to talk about that. The booms, that I forgot to talk about something important, so I'm, I'm coming back. The booms, they will carry only direct stresses from bending, from the bending. And the zero thickness skin will carry only shear <coughs> stress from the shear flow, all right? Either from torsion or transverse shear. While in the real structure, the stringers, they only carry direct stress from bending, right? The stringers, they only carry direct stresses from bending, but the skin in the real structure carries shear stress and direct stress from bending as well, okay? So what we are doing in the idealizer structure is the direct stresses in the skin, they are all going to be transferred to the boom. And then in the our idealizer structure, our skin will only carry shear stresses. That's it. Okay? So this is a model. Of course, there are some assumptions. That's why we are now here considering the direct stresses in our real plate. In this real structure here, we are considering only direct stresses. Why? Because we want to see how we can transfer the direct stresses from the skin to the boom. All right? That's why I'm doing this now. And then what I'm going to, of course, now assume here is that my boom B1 will have, will be carrying a direct stress, which is sigma 1, equal to this one here. And my boom B2 is going to be carrying a direct stress, which is equal to sigma 2. That's it. I think I can draw this a little bit better. Okay. And then what, what, what am I going to do now? Now this is very critical, very important. I'm going to say something like this. If you look at the real structure, I can calculate the moments, for example, summation of the moments about point two, which is this point here. I can do this, right? And I can do the same for my idealized structure. So my point two in the idealized structure, I can also say I can calculate summation of moments about point <coughs> two, which is this point where we have boom number two. I can also calculate the moments in my idealized structure about point number two. And then, because I'm, I'm looking for an equivalent idealized structure, what I'm going to say is the moments produced by this loading in the real structure about point two needs to be equal to the moments produced by the loading on the idealized structure about the same point two. By saying that these two moments need to be equal, I will get what? From that equation, I will be able to calculate the area of the boom, as we are going to see now, okay? So let's do that. Let's calculate the moment. Let's start with the real structure. So I'm going to do something like this. Please try to follow. If not, make, ask me to stop. And So I'm going to divide this distributed load in two parts.
I'm going to consider this rectangular shape first. And I'm going to calculate the moment produced by this rectangular shape about 0.2. And then I'm going to add the moment produced by this triangular shape about 0.2. We did this in year one, I, I remember. So let's do that. Let's start with the rectangular shape in green. So I will have, I will have, so I'm going to use the green color. I will have a stress, which is sigma 2. You agree with me? But in order to have the force, I will have to multiply. So I need to get the area uh, of this rectangular shape. So I need to multiply this stress by an area. And that area is going to be the area of this wall. You agree with me? Which is how much? TB. T is the thickness, B is the width, right? So I, by doing this, I get what? I get force, right? But that force, but I want a moment, isn't it? So that force is going to be a force that is going to be located here somewhere in the centroid of this rectangle, right? So if I want a moment about point 0.2, that moment is going to be Sorry, that force is in the opposite direction, right? It's going to be in, the, in this direction, right? If I want a moment, I need to multiply this force by what? B over, B over 2, right? Very good. So I need to multiply this by B over 2, and then I get the moment. You all agree? <coughs> that is the contribution of the rectangular shape in green there. But I need to add now the contribution of the triangular shape. So I need the area of this triangle, which is, so this length here is sigma one minus sigma two. You all agree with me? Yeah. So let's put it here, sigma one minus sigma two. I need some more space here. So I need, if I multiply by the width, which is B, and divide by two, I get what? What is this? Force, exactly. This is the equivalent force produced by this triangular shape. And we know that that force will be located on the centroid of this triangle, which is at the distance from point two, which is two thirds of B, right? Remember this? So in order to get a moment, I need to multiply this force now by what? Sorry, I need to multiply by thickness here. I forgot as well, right? Because I need an area. So this is the force. So in order to obtain the moment, I need to multiply this force by what? Two thirds B, right? That's it. You all agree this is the, the moment produced at about 0.2 by this triangular shape. So this contribution gives me, <coughs> this uh, addition here gives me the contribution of the moment of the real structure. Now we are going to calculate the moment of the idealized structure. I'm going to do the same now. Calculate the moment about this, oops about this point two, I'm going to do it in blue. Moment about this point two. So sigma two, does in the boom number two, this sigma two in boom two does not produce any moment about point two. You all agree with me? The moment is zero. So the only one that is producing a moment is this direct stress at boom one. And that moment is very easy, in fact, to obtain. So I have, let's start with the force. So sigma one is the stress. I need to obtain a force, so I need to multiply sigma one by which area? Area of boom one, which is B1. Okay? So that's, this gives me a force. In order to obtain the moment, I need to multiply now this force by what? <coughs> by B. That's it. 
That's why I love idealized structures. They are so simple. The no now, what we can do, we can simplify some things. We can, for example, we can do this, let's say. Hmm. First, we can cancel the B. This B, I can cancel with this, and I can cancel with this, for example, right? That is one thing I can do. I can multiply everything by 2, and then I obtain sigma 2 TB plus two thirds sigma one BT minus two thirds sigma two BT, right? Is going to be equal to two times sigma one B1. I can simplify this a little bit more because I have here sigma 2 TB. So I have 3 thirds minus 2 thirds. So I will have 1 third sigma 2 TB plus 2 thirds sigma 1 BT equal to 2 sigma 1 B1. What else can I do? Well, I can divide everything by 2 and everything by sigma 1, and then I will obtain 1 over 6, sigma 2 over sigma 1 bt, plus 2 over 6, Right? BT is equal to B1. We are getting there. If I'm having any mistake here, please let me know. Is it okay so far? We can... I, I can try to continue here. So B1, which is the area of the boom that we are looking for, is going to be equal to... is going to be equal to, I think something is not correct here. I'm missing some, oh no, it's, may, might be okay, let's see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see at the end, uh, if I get final result, result. All right, so what can I do? I can say we will get BT over six, and then we will have what? BT over six, we will have uh, two, plus sigma 2 over sigma 1. It's correct, right? Yes. And this is the correct result. So we have everything right. Look at this equation, this final equation here. Can, can, can you see it? This final equation is very important. Why? Look at this. Don't forget, we are looking for the area this B1 is the area of the boom, and we can get the area of the boom. What is this B? Small caps B is the width of the plate. We know this. T is the thickness. We know this. Then we only need to consider the ratio between sigma 2 and sigma 1. And you might think, oh, we don't know these stresses, sigma 2 and sigma 1. How do we do it? Now that's that's what I'm going... No, no, it's very, it's very quick. It's very quick. I oh, still have time. So let's explore this equation now. I'm going to copy the equation here again. So... Wait, I can maybe copy this figure as well. Let's see. Copy. Paste. And now I can copy my equation here, copy, paste, very good, look at this, the 
Don't forget one thing, one very important thing. These stresses that you have here, sigma 1 and sigma 2 in the booms, these are direct stresses. When do we have direct stresses? In bending. The shear stresses, they come from transverse shear and torsion, right? The direct stresses is from bending. So one thing we know, these direct stresses, they come from bending. What else do we know? Well, we know that we will have, imagine, for example, a, a cross-section of a wing. Imagine you will have this boom one and boom two here. So this is going to be boom two, boom one. We have the neutral axis here. Right? So these are our two booms. If I'm telling you that you will, we will have the stress sigma 1 and sigma 2 in these two booms from bending, I can calculate these stresses from bending, right? Using the very the, the symmetric bending equation, you know that the stresses from bending, they are obtained from the bending moment, M, times the distance to the neutral axis, over the second moment of area, right? Look at this. I can say, okay, for my boom one, my sigma one is going to be equal to the bending moment. Bending moment does not change. It's the bending moment you have on the wing, right? It's a constant in the cross section. Times the distance of boom one to the neutral axis over the second moment of area of the entire cross section, which we know. And the stress in boom number two is also given by the bending moment times the distance to the neutral axis of boom number two over second moment of area as well. And look now how easy this is going to be because we are looking of the ratio between sigma two and sigma one. If I just replace these two equations to obtain sigma two over sigma one, I will get what? I will get my2 over i over my1 over i, right? M cancels, second moment of area cancels, so I end up with y2 over y1, right? Look at this. I'm looking for the area of boom one but I don't know how much is this ratio between these two stresses, but I do know that this ratio is equal to the ratio of the distance to the neutral axis of these two booms. And it, that is something that we know. Because you know the geometry of your wing, you know where you want to put your booms, so you know the distance to the neutral axis of the booms. Then problem is solved. All right? That's how easy, how easy we... Huh? You think I simplified too much? Maybe I did. But I can give you an example. We can do a, a very quick example here, right? So let's, let's suppose, for example, let's try to, to, to make one, one very quick example. Imagine I give you this. Imagine I give you this real, let's say, a C shape a C-shape cross-section, like this one. Let's assume that the thickness is equal to 10. Okay, constant, equal to 10. So, I know the neutral axis, where is the location of the, ne the neutral axis in bending, is in the passing on the centroid of this cross-section. What I want you to do is, okay, I want you to calculate to obtain an idealized structure with one boom at this point, another boom here, another boom here, another boom here. So the neutral axis is again in the same position, all right? I want you to build this idealized structure. Let's do this example and then we go home, okay? A very quick one. I know you are very tired. You're behaving very well, so you deserve but let's do this. So my question is, so let's, let's say this is boom number one, boom number two, three, four. 
I know the locations where I want to put these booms in my idealized structure. What I don't know is the area of these booms. But I know that the area, for example, if I'm calculating boom one, the area of boom number one, oh, we need to put some dimensions here, right? So let's say, let's say that this distance from here to here is 100. Same thing on this one, 100 as well, okay? And this width from here to here, also 100. Okay, let's make it is no, no, let's make 200. Because then you can mix the 100s and I don't want that. 200, okay? So, the equation for the area of boom 1 is, I'm going to write it here, bt over 6, 2, plus, now we need a ratio on the direct stresses. So we need the ratio between uh, sigma 2 and sigma 1. So don't forget, we are building, we are looking at this panel here now, on the top. Don't forget, we, our starting point was always starting from a plate. We want to build an idealized plate, if you want, with two booms, right? <coughs> In the extremity. So this is similar with this, right? So the booms we are talking about is boom one and boom two. So I need to get the ratio here between the direct stress at boom two and the direct stress in boom one. <coughs> Which we know this is going to be equivalent to Y2 over Y1. But let's replace now this with numbers. So how much is the width this B? of my plate. How much is it? 200. Thickness, 10 over 6. 2 plus. Now, what, um, what do I need to include now? I need to include the distance to the neutral axis of boom number 2 over the distance to the neutral axis of boom number 1. How much is Y2? 100. The distance to the neutral axis of boom number two is 100. How much is the distance to the neutral axis of boom number one? 100. You get your area. Is this difficult? No. Very easy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do now the area. So you get the area of boom one, which from symmetry should be equal to the area of boom four. Yeah. All right? Don't forget, we, the starting, the real structure was a symmetric structure. We need to keep the symmetry in the idealized structure, right? <coughs> so let's calculate now the area of boom number three. For example, or the area of boom number two. How do you calculate the area of boom number two? B2. So you need to have again BT over 6, 2 plus. Now you need the ratio sigma 1 over sigma 2. Now you need to flip, flip this. Okay? Isn't it? Oh, sorry, I put the same. I'm so sorry. It's time to finish. Is this, right? Because if you look at this equation here, we were, we derived this equation, right? And this equation was for the area of boom number one. You agree? Yeah. So the ratio includes in the numerator is the the other boom, direct stress, over boom one, right? That's what I'm doing, exactly what I'm doing here. For B1, I consider the area of the other, the, sorry, the direct stress of the other boom, which was boom two. Now, when I want to calculate the, the area of boom two, I need to consider the direct stress of the other boom, which in this case is boom one, right? In our panel, you agree with me? But, do you think 
This is it for boom number two. Do you think this is it? What about this? What about this plate here? This vertical plate here? Don't you think there is going to be a contribution to the area of my boom number two from this vertical plate as well? So I need to add, I need to add here, what? I need to add, and this is now very important, look at this. I need to have my, I'm going to write again BT over six, two plus, I need now sigma three over sigma two. I'm going to write like this and then we, we can replace. So you just do exactly the same analysis we did before for one plate with two booms at the end. But don't forget, boom two here is sharing this horizontal plate at the top with the vertical tape. So we need to add these two contributions together for the area of boom number two. This is very important, okay? But this is not difficult because look, let's replace now. How much is the the width we need to consider for this vertical plate? Is 100 or 200? <coughs> we are looking for the width of the plate. We are looking for this dimension now, right? Which is 200, right? So my B now here is going to be equal to 200. The thickness is again 10 times 10. Now, sigma 3 over sigma 2, I need to replace this ratio with the ratio involving the distance to the neutral axis, y3 over y2. How much is y3? The distance to neutral axis. Minus 100, yes. Minus 100, very important. Don't forget we are talking about bending, right? So 0.3 is below the neutral axis, minus 100. And Y2, how much is that distance, Y2? 100 positive, right? So there is some, we'll get here 2 minus 1. Very important. And here... I can replace these ones as well, right? So how much is this BT over six for the horizontal panel in the top? My B is 200, right? So it's 200 times 10, which is the thickness over six. And now this ratio here is, is one, right? I can put one like this. So we will have what? We will have for boom number two, we will have 2,000 over 6 times 3 plus 2,000 over 6 times 1. So we have, uh, yeah, 2,000 over 6 times 4. Agree? or 8,000 over six is the area of boom two. The area of boom one, we can continue, is 2,000 over six times three. So look at this. The area of boom one is going to be smaller than the area of boom two, which makes sense because boom two is sharing this vertical plate with this horizontal plate while boom one is only sharing this horizontal plate, so the area needs to be smaller, everything makes sense. All right? <coughs> Any questions? So at this point, the only thing we did so far was to, de to develop a method to obtain the area of the booms. And then what we are going to do next week is we are going to look again to the transverse shear, but on this, Skin booms idealized structures, and you are going to see how easy that is going to be. Okay, right? I'm making your life easy.
Sorry? Okay, all it's going to be. Bye, see you next week. <laughs>